my name's Ann Brown, and this is yeah. Andrew Welke. And so again, today we're going to be talking about the Genotype Comparison Visualization Tool, or GCIVIT for short. So just a brief introduction of what is GCIVIT. Uh, GCIVIT is a new interactive tool for whole genome-wide visualization of resequencing or SNP array data. Um, what makes GCIVIT unique is that it takes a VCF file as input. Um, and so GCIVIT allows a user to compare two or more its sessions. So, if we're um, so yeah, uh, we can compare two or more its sessions and visually identify regions of similarity and differences across the whole genome. And so just the background of how GCIVIT was developed and how the idea came up for it. Um, it start, this collaboration started from wanting to plot SNP data on a genome-wide scale. Uh, current SNP viewing software, such as Flapjack, um, SNPversity, um, I'm trying to think what else, what other programs I've looked at, but anyways, current SNP viewing software was limited to just to, to see a select small region um, of the genome to view the SNPs. So you would just see four to five SNPs or maybe up to 10 SNPs in a window. And you'd have to scroll through to see the differences between your selected at sessions. But what we wanted to do was be able to see differences between its sessions on a whole genome wide scale. And so how this idea came up was my research involves comparing international soybean at sessions. And so what I was doing was comparing soybean at sessions from the US to soybean at sessions from Korea. When I was doing this work, I identified lines that had the exact same name. So for example, they were both labeled Peking. Um, but looking at the genotype data, those two at sessions were completely different. There is no similarity. Um, I think they only had about a 60 to 70% similarity. So meaning they were really different. And so what I wanted to do was to see, well, how are these lines different? Um, do they differ in just one region of the chromosome? Do they differ across all 20 chromosomes? And so that's where this tool really came up. Um, so we we're talking about, well, how can I visualize this data? And that's when my supervisor said, oh, well, talk to Andrew. <laughs> and maybe you guys can help uh, figure something out and look at um, other tools that are available and see if we can work with that. So again, it came from my research of wanting to identify differences between international soybean at sessions. And so Andrew's going to talk a little bit about the development history. Yeah, so um, at the time that before this, I've been working on a couple of different uh, job search tools, and one of them was, uh, by just reason, there's a comma there, uh, one of them was CIVIT.js, which was a JavaScript um, implementation of an existing uh, set of Perl scripts for doing uh, whole genome visualization. And the concept was essentially uh, drawing things on things. So it was relatively, um, relatively data, or relatively um, what a diagnostic, but um, one of the keys was that at the time it was only supporting drawing from a, a GFF file. So uh, the challenge of this was using this tool that we had existed and have a way to uh, take it and use some outside of context data and have a way of allowing a user to uh, build the queries they wanted to see as opposed to having to go and talk to the bioinformaticist time and time again saying, hey, I would like or you know, have to go down to the scripts and say, each time they wanted a new view generated, have to go through and do a bunch of meta configuration of uh, files and then re-render the picture. So um, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the development came from this idea of, okay, we have this drawing program and we have, so, we have these files and let's find a way to make them uh, talk to each other, behave and find a way to make it so it's interactive and uh, user friendly. Um, so in the end, we kind of, or kind of came up with this um, method of having a uh, backend server that was running backend server with a uh, UI that 
combined a new query builder with the existing um, the existing display software that was exist or existing, and then using uh, just standard REST requests, you could request back to the server and say, "Hey, what do you have? What's available?" And then uh, be able to tell, or then be able to let the um, and be able to get that full list, be able to get those experiments listed, be able to get those so data from those experiments listed in a way that it would become uh, useful. Um, so the back end, after much trial and error, was uh, written in uh, Google's Golang. Uh, this was determined mostly because of the fact that it was, uh, it's very much a uh, internet service forward language. Uh, the tools built, the tooling built into the language make it very easy to get going with the server quickly and be able to do this type, or be able to set up this type of information. Um, the, and after some experimenting, it was determined to build based off a package called FastHTTP, which is a um, native language uh, server that can hold plenty of concurrent connections, is very low on, uh, pro on system overhead, and makes it pretty easy to um, insert other middleware. So if you want so if you want to add some logging or if you want to add some uh, authentication, it was already intended as part of the workflow and made it extremely fast. Um, the front end, since the uh, yeah, Civet was already written with React, it was pretty easy just to integrate more React uh, components in to make it available. Um, a lot of the idea of this was to make a small, easy to integrate into a web page um, widget and then make the CSS fairly generic and simple. So if someone came along later and wanted to customize things, it would to fit you know, their site or to uh, make changes, it would be relatively uh, easy to do so, logical to do so to make those uh, changes. So then going up, so now that we've gone over kind of the back end um, and the front end design of GCivit, um, how can GCivit be used? So how are plant breeders gonna use this? How are uh, scientists gonna be able to use this tool? And so, one example is SNP validation. So with GCivit, if you have a study and you created a bunch of SNPs, you're gonna to wanna to be able to see if these SNPs lie um, across all 20 chrome or across the chromosomes, or do you just have SNPs that fall into one certain region of the chromosome? So you can really, again, use this tool as SNP validation. Um, also, do your SNPs lie in the middle of the chromosomes or do we see them on the end, ends of the chromosomes like where we should see them? So again, it's a validation tool. Um, we can use it for pedigree analysis. And what I mean by pedigree analysis is we can plot, if we know the pedigree of a certain line, we can plot that line against its two parents. We can plot the differences um, of a line and its parents to see which regions were inherited from which parent. We can identify integrations. Um, we can, again, plot differences between, for example, in soybean, wild soybean and cultivated soybean to see, again, are there regions that are different in all the cultivated soybeans but not the wild or vice versa. Uh, we can identify regions selected. Oh, I got that off, wrong. Identify regions selected during domestication. Um, so again, identify regions um, when we're comparing wild and cultivated soybeans together. And again, I'll show examples of all of these. Um, but going back to identify integrations, we can, again, identify regions that were intergressed from a certain parent. So for example, going with the pedigree analysis, if we have a line that we know um, a certain region was integrated from a certain parent, we can then plot the differences between these accessions and then identify the, that region that was integrated. Um, so again, we can compare accessions with the same name. And again, this is, what hap this is how GCivit came to be was because I was comparing accessions that had the same name in mind to see, okay, well, these accessions have the same name, are they gene, and, but gene typically they're not the same. So again, where are they not the same at? And again, an exploratory tool. If you say you have 
a few lines that of our interest to you and you want to compare them to a reference. Um, you can do that and then see if there's any regions that pop up as being interesting. So say you have five lines that have a certain phenotypic trait. You can compare those lines to a line that doesn't have that phenotypic trait and see what well, are there any regions that are different between all five lines and the reference. So again, you can use that as an, as an exploratory tool. And so at this point in the presentation, we're gonna go into a live demo of Juice of It. Um, I gotta first minimize this so I have to go up. Um, do the demo first because we're about 10 minutes in. So. Okay. Okay, so can someone just confirm to make sure you guys can see the soy-based G7 page? Yep. Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so this is G7 up on soybase. And what we can see, let me get a laser pointer. Or maybe not. <laughs> um, so this is G7 up and running on the soy base page. So the first link we have on the page is there's a video tutorial of G7. And then if we click here, we can see all the data sets that are available um, on soybean that we have available so far. So we have the data set citation. And if we want to view the source, this just takes us to the soy base data store where you can download the raw BCF files. So the first thing we want to do when running G7 is to select your data set and your reference genotype. So what I say by reference genotype is when you're comparing your lines, what do you want to compare your lines to? Um, so the nice thing about GCIVIT is your reference genotype does not have to be what the reference genome is for your species. It can be any, um, it can be any accession that is in the data set. So in this example, I'm going to do our demo data set. This is a demo subset of the SOYSNIP 50K data set. Um, so it just has 20 accessions in it. And when we plot information for this, um, data set and for our genotype. I'm going to select a color to show what um, for what the succession is going to be. So again for the reference genotype I'm going to put G soja as the reference genotype. So then every comparison I make is going to be compared to this G soja accession. And so after we select our reference accession we can then add a comparison. So here, again, we have our, we pick a color of when we plot, um, what does our, what color do you want the succession to be? So I'm gonna make it pink. And right now we can only compare within the same data set. So we cannot select a new data set. Um, we already have, so the demo SNP 50K subset is already selected for us. And then we select, an, that session we want to compare to G Soja. Um, in this example, I'm going to pick Williams 82. And so we can then add more comparisons or delete them. Um, in this example, I'm just going to show one comparison. For next, we move on to the options for our display. Um, so we have the title. If you want to add a title, here I'll do demo. Um, bin size, ruler display, and ruler interval. I'm going to leave at the default settings. If you have any questions about the bin size, ruler display, ruler interval, we do have help documentation at the bottom of the tool. So if you can click on that. Um, we have about, and then we have our reference comparison. You can click to see help for this. So general options, there we go. So again, if you have any questions about what um, these, the bin size, again, the ruler display is, just click on the help documentation. 
So next we move on to left options. This is gonna be what do we wanna display on the left-hand side of the chromosomes. So in this example, I'm going to put histogram. And then what type of comparison do we wanna do? Do we wanna see differences, same or total? So in this example, I'm gonna to pick total. And then filter genotypes is do you wanna filter to just show one um, at session on that side of the chromosome. So I'm gonna pick G-Soja. So what I'm showing here is we're gonna show the total number of SNPs we have for G-Soja in a histogram display. And then we have min and max value. And again, with, I'm just gonna leave them at the default. Um, but again, if you need help with the min or max, we can, you can look at the help display. Okay, and so then on the right-hand side, I'm gonna do the same with histogram. I'm gonna do differences. And for this, since if we pick the comparison differences, we're only gonna have one genotype available because we're gonna be comparing Williams-82 to G-Soja. And then again, I'm gonna leave the min and max the same. And so then after you pick your options, you now hit display. And here are our results. So again, this is showing all of it. So on the left-hand side of the chromosome, where we see the brown, let me scroll up. You broke the iframe. Good yeah. job. I don't know what you did. You broke it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, um, we should be able to scroll up and see a key up here, but it looks like a... I think it's because it's in this sub window, the iframe, it's like badly. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> um, there is a key where you can scroll down or where it'll pop up and show you exactly, remind you what does brown indicate, what does um, pink indicate. So again, in this example, we have the total number of SNPs, represented in blue in brown. And then in pink, we have the differences between G. Soja and Williams 82. And the black regions are the centromeric or the black boxes represent the centromeric regions. And so again, what else makes G. Soja unique is it's interactive. So we can zoom in, we can zoom out, um, and then we can get to um, the regular view. So it takes it back to the main view. Um, when we have it on the hand, we can scroll around, we can move the display, we can draw on the display. And so when we, you can draw on this display, you can also change the color of what you want it to be. So here we have a red line. If you're interested in a certain region, um, we can draw a box around that region. And again, you can change the color of the box to whatever color you would like. There we go. And then we also have the erase tool. And so then we also, say you're only interested in chromosomes one through 10, we can turn off chromosomes. So here I'm turning off chromosomes 11 through 20. We can also, if we're only interested in seeing what's on the left-hand side of the chromosome, we can turn off right, or we can turn off the left. So again, this is just showing, the pink is showing again, just the differences between Williams 82 and G Soja. So if we're only interested in that, um, we can do that. And then finally, we can turn off the centromeric repeats if we're interested or leave them on. And so then finally, um, I was gonna download. Oh, you killed that when you killed Iper. Oh, so, well, finally you could be able to download the images. Oh, I forgot about 
this. Sorry, I forgot about showing this. And this is actually one of the very unique features and um, of G7. It's a really good feature. So say you find a region of interest using G7, you can then click on that region and learn more about that region. So here we're in bin seven on chromosome one. We're showing base pairs 35, 35 350,000 to 400,000? Roughly, yeah. Roughly. So, yep, we're sh the, so the base pairs were shown on that chromosome. And so here, Williams 82 has 35 differences, or that's how many counts are in this bin for Williams 82. And so we can search for this PI. This is going to um, show well because of Zoom, oh. Zoom right now. Well, so we can search for this PI at GRIN. So here we have Williams 82. We have information of it for it um, at GRIN. It's not sharing, showing the same window, I think. Oh. You open the window up so it won't be showing. Here. Oh, it did. Oh, sorry. I don't know if you guys can see that it went to GRIN. Yeah, we can see that. Okay. Oh, okay. So it did show that. All right, now, how do we go back to G7? <laughs> yeah, there it goes. Okay. Um, it's not the original display. No. Uh, oh, well, there we go. Sorry, I was getting lost. Of, where the screens were. Okay, so we can search for it at Grin. Okay. I got it. Okay. Um, so then we can also view this region in GBrowse. So if we open in a new tab. We can then see this region um, in the soy-based GBrowse. And then we can also show um, this region in the LIS context viewer. So again, this tool is very interactive and has a lot of um, neat tool or yeah, mm -hmm. unique features with it. But if we go back really quick to which and G7, which full G7. Mm -hmm. And so finally, um, this didn't show up in the picture I created, but here's the key. So this will show you um, once you have stuff displayed, it'll sh the key will be right here. And then you can also download your results. You can download the picture as an SVG or a PNG. And then you can also download the data. You can download the raw data as a GFF file. Uh, the VCF file that we used as input for GCIVIT, as I shown before, that is available um, in the data set options. So what I showed earlier. So here um, you can draw, download the raw VCF files here. Again, this is for soybean. Okay, so that's a demo of GCIVIT. So now we'll go back to our presentation. This one. Bring up the show. And so here's some further examples. Um, in this example, oh, in this example, we're identifying interactions between Andean and Mesoamerican populations in common being. So I used. Uh, Andean line as a reference. And so differences between Andean lines, three other Andean lines and the reference are indicated in cool colors. So the purple, pink, and blue. And then regions that are different between Mesoamerican lines and the Andean lines. 
and the Andean reference are shown in the warm colors. And so what we can see here is on chromosome 11, there are very few differences between this Andean line and the Mesoamerican lines, but quite a few differences between the Andean reference and the other Andean lines, indicating that there might that there is probably an introgression from the Mesoamerican populations on this chromosome. <laughs> there we go. Um, here's an example of pedigree analysis used in haplotype. So this is using soybean line Brenville and comparing it to its sibling Clark and its parents Lincoln and Richland. Um, so what we see here is basically any, uh, anywhere there's a difference between Brenville and its sibling Clark, there's also a difference between one of the parents indicating that this, this region was inherited um, to one sibling but not the other. And so again, this is just showing the differences between um, Brenville and its parents. So again, you can see which regions were inherited from which parent. This is to identify conserved regions in soybean. So again, this is identifying regions associated with domestication. Here I compared seven glycine max lines and three glycine soja lines against a glycine max reference. And we can see here on chromosome five and chromosome 20 that there are, so color indicates difference in this example and heat map. So we can see on chromosome five and some regions on chromosome 20 that there's really no differences between the reference and all of the other glycine max lines, but there are differences between the reference and the soja lines, indicating that this region might have been selected for domestication. And in this example, I also highlighted GM15 um, because this is how it can be used as an exploratory tool. We see that there's no differences between the reference and then these three lines in the middle. So then it'll bring up questions of, well, what lies in this region? What could potentially be in this region? that makes these three lines um, identical to the reference, but not any of the other lines. Then finally, this is an example of identifying differences between two lines with the same name. In this example, it's a tale of two Dwights. So the soybean accession name is Dwight. And here we can see the two differences, or the differences between these two lines only fall into certain regions of the chromosome. Um, we can see a little bit on GMO2 and a little bit on the rest of the chromosomes. But the differences between these two lines are not across all 20 chromosomes. And they, again, they only fall into small regions, indicated, indicating that these two lines um, were grown out, started off the same, but then they were grown out um, in separate populations. So in this example, the collaborator got Dwight from Grin but then grown out, grew the line out for multiple generations in his own lab. And so here again, we're comparing Dwight from um, a researcher's lab versus Dwight to Grin, directly from the Grin um, repository. Whereas here's an example of two lines that were PI424032, where they were both labeled this, but as you see, they are completely different. The differences lie across all 20 chromosomes. They're across all chromosomes. It's not, they're not just, uh, the differences are not just isolated to one certain region of the chromosome, it's across all the chromosomes. And talking to this collaborator, we real he realized that the line was mislabeled. So seeing these differences, it confirmed that yes, the wrong um, line was mislabeled, as in these two lines, even though they have the same name, they're not the same. So we did confirm the error there. And so then availability and usage. Usage, it has um, MIT license and it's available on GitHub um, under the Legume Federation. And so for more help with GCivit, we do have a blog post on the Legume Federation website and you can find the blog post here. 
um, our paper was also recently published um, just last week. So um, there's a GOI for the paper as well. And we also are working on more tutorials. We do have one, the main YouTube video, uh, tutorial, but there will be more YouTube tutorials coming very soon. Very soon yeah. But if we got the encoding issues. <laughs> yep. All right. And so with that, we can take any questions you may have. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for the presentation. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> uh, just real quick. Um, this is great. I, I was a bit curious about what was needed to populate the tool. You might have said this before, but uh, do you just require a VCF file or is there a database backend as well? Um, no, at this time, it's just a VCF file. Um, all the um, data is generated from reading in a VCF um, line wise and parsing it relatively quickly to get the result in G GFF. In the future, it would be uh, one of the things that I want to take with it in development is making it um, able to talk to databases and that are already existing and be able to query from that so you don't have to worry about uh, duplicated data sets or anything else like that. The tool itself uh, runs in, can run in a Docker image so you can even uh, just bake your data into a single use Docker instance and uh, keep it all self-contained. Okay, thanks. You know, I forgot to mention, we did have a, a bash shell window up in case anyone was curious. Yeah, well, to, if there's any questions about configuration, so can Okay. <laughs> to show how to get JSON up and running. To, to continue on with that line of thinking, um, if you haven't explored Brappy yet, I am a strong advocate of Brappy um, and would highly recommend that for getting data from multiple different databases. Yep. Um, so the, the request itself is mostly, uh, or can be dealt with as, it can take data from remote sources. So um, as long as it's in the, for, as long as it's in for, support format. So right now, since it's VCF, it's VCF, but um, I do want, yeah, I do want to play more with uh, grabbing um, external data with uh, existing APIs and making it more uh, universal, or being able to use it with, already existing it's just a more existing data sets and having to just kind of use uh, standalone files. Um, so we have a question uh, posted on the chat. Um, do you provide pro plan to provide an image of the tool in Galaxy for users to use on their own data? Um, otherwise, how easy is it for it to work for a small time biologist? Um, so we just actually had a uh, graduate student in Canada uh, get it up and running for uh, their own data and aside from a uh, small formatting error on there and it was pretty uh, apparently painless to uh, get going. Um, There's some naming issues. Um, all you need is a couple of files. You need your VCF file, then you need a uh, GFF file that uh, lists your backbones that you're using for it and um, total time is uh, maybe, I'd say, what, an hour or so if you're not really familiar with it. Uh, time to build a Docker container is about five minutes. Um, yeah. It's... Um, there hasn't been a plan of adding it to Galaxy, but it's something I'll definitely look into. Um, I'll make a note of that right now, actually. Uh, one of the other goals would be also a try, is um, in the future, is getting it in a standalone uh, Electron desktop app for people to use without having to do as much uh, work on the command line. <laughs> Response to that was awesome. <laughs> yes. <Yep. laughs> yeah, I, I, I will admit I have used this tool many times and there is a slight learning cur curve to kind of figure out, um, you know, basically what kind of, what kind of uh, glyph, you know, do you want to use uh, the boxes or the histogram, like which one really works best for you? But it's still really fun to play around with. I found it almost almost like something just to see, ooh, pretty colors. <laughs> That's the best way to really to show it. But I've I've had a lot of fun just messing around with the tool. And um uh, hi I that's why I invited you because I really thought this would be useful for a lot of other people to use. Um and maybe even integrate into your own database is something they can use since we're, a lot of people now are bringing in a lot of uh, more SNP data into the databases. Um, Lovely. And that's why we provide to the um, link to the paper and then also the legume fed blog post because 
there you can see examples of um, how each, how, let's see, how the different glyphs were used or display types. So the boxes, the heat map, the histograms. Um, so then you can get an idea of what you wanna, if you use this tool, um, what display type is gonna be the best for you. And if you do have a display that you want and, or that you think would work, make sense and work, um, the GitHub is always open for adding requests or um, adding suggestions for data or glyphs because while I know that it, I like people or a community to take over and actually add their own custom things, um, I know that there's a definite learning curve to learning how to make your own modifications except for a couple of small things that were potentially made easy to mod edit. So there's always that thing of, I like this. So please, please send any requests, play with it. Uh, <laughs> let me know bugs because it's, you know, when you're so familiar with the tool after having been working on it, it's pretty easy to um, have oversights on things that would make, or that don't necessarily make sense from someone who hasn't used it before, or has other use cases. So I'm always open for more feedback to make sure that everything is covered and it works ways that people like it to. And then going back to the displays as well, um, again, Really soon we will have individual tutorials describing each display type. So we'll have a um, video tutorial displaying the heat map, the haplotype and histogram display, um, display types. So hopefully those will be up very soon. <laughs> um, I just, is there a limit to the data sets that you can upload, the size of the data sets? Uh, the limit is entirely on processing time. Um, but the number of data sets and the number of features in the data set are, are only limited by essentially your patience. Um, the time it takes to read a data set is pretty, or to um, or have a data set added doesn't take much. So it doesn't really care about how much you have um, in that way. Um, it does start slowing down noticeably uh, when the gzip file gets above, um, oh God, what was it about? 25, 30 gigabytes or so, um, where you can where response time gets to get into the minutes. Um, one of the things I've been working on recently is finding ways of um, doing better caching on common requests and most used files to uh, speed up the process of um, getting results for larger data sets, especially uh, maybe you can get some pre-processing done in the uh, process. I'll also add that for very large or dense uh, VCF files, we have a utility to sample um, the variants. I guess may maybe related to that question of size. So when you were doing the demo, um, it wasn't possible to select um, genotypes from different data sets. And I imagine that's because when when they don't have the same sites in common, it's hard to know what to do with the things that they don't have in common. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, roughly, there's no way to necessarily validate that it was um, using the same uh, overall reference and everything else to make sure the sites were actually the same site. So until we get a solution in place there that at least can give similar sites with certainty, um, it was decided that it was best to keep it locked to within the same uh, uh, experiment for the purposes of this. Uh, that's not saying the tool itself can support reading multiple files and support going across files, but there's just no way to uh, provide good verified data at this time to make it work that way. Though I will add what you can do is you can merge VCF files using uh, VCF tools. So if you do have two VCF files that you know were run on the same reference, and you can identify, um, well, yeah, you just know that they were run on the same reference. You can use BCF tools merge or VCF tools merge to merge those two VCF files. You can merge them on common SNP positions or you can just merge them all together. And so that's how, when I was comparing the two Dwight's, two Dwight's from two different studies, that's how I, that was done, was I t merged my own VCF file and created a merged VCF file that was then used in GCivit. Um, so again, being able to compare across data sets, that is something that we're gonna work on in the future. 
but again, you can do that yourself by using BCF tools or VCF tools to merge the VCF files. And again, that's knowing that they were, uh, they were both created using the same reference genotype or reference um, to call the SNPs. Yeah, I guess, I mean, the, the issue that I guess comes up there is that when you, when you use merge in that way, you know, if you have a variant called in the one file and not in the other, you kind of get a dot, <laughs> which yep. sort of says, well, you know, they didn't call it, but I don't know whether it, that means it matches the reference or I didn't have coverage or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and that's why usually when I've merged VCF files, I merge them based on common positions. Right. The problem with that though is you can, you get a small number of SNPs, which can be good or bad. Right, have, have you thought about um, support for GVCF, which kind of is supposed to address that by representing you know, sites where you did, did have coverage, but you didn't make a call? You know, I have not, to be uh, honest, I've not heard of GCBF, GVCF. <laughs> so I definitely look into that. Yeah, a lot of the support for that is just more of a, if people request it, I'll build it out uh, as long as there's a reasonable standard to appraise to because the uh, underlying uh, parsing library is something I had to work together myself and it's performant, but uh, it is pretty strict on the actual, uh, right now the GFF and the VCF uh, format uh, specification. So if I get more requests for formats, I'll add more to it and make sure it all behaves nicely. It's very much a very quick input output uh, streaming solution that does a lot of uh, character level encoding comparisons to try to make it go as fast as physically possible. Um, one other unrelated question. So if, if you have um, heterozygotes in your data sets, how are you um, thinking about those when you're doing the comparisons? So, um, I think in this one, they're considering, they're treating heterozygotes as missing data. Gonna have to look at the code. <laughs> yeah, um, it's been a while since I last code that, so I'm not entirely sure. Um, most of the time, it will look at um, direct similarities and try to see if things match, or we'll try to check matches before no matches and it, I do there's uh, there's handling for cases where it's partial match or semi match. I just can't remember what the uh, algorithm I used in the place off the top of my head is. It's been a while since I last counted that. Yeah, and I well before um, a lot of the VCF files that we use on in the soy base instant, I um, formatted the VCF files so. A lot of those VCF files, I did change any heterozygous data to missing data before even making them available. Um, I didn't do that to every VCF file, but some of them I did change heterozygous, heterozygous SNP positions to missing data. So I think some of the, those heterozygous uh, SNP positions are treated as, um, again, missing data. But we'll have to go back in the code and see how it's... Um, <laughs> How it's I know there's some handling in place, I just can't remember what, the, what way it handles it. Um. And I think it's treated as a whole difference because we did work a lot on that and make some uh, yeah. pictures. Well, I want to thank you again, Andrew and Anne, for giving us great presentation and showing your tool. Um, if anyone is interested in contacting them, their email addresses and contact inf information is on Soybase. So you're welcome to contact them about their tool and don't forget to check out their new paper. And thanks again, I appreciate it. I'll see you guys awesome. next month. Thanks.